the same message that was sent by Hella in Denmark when she won election only a few weeks ago, that progressive answers are the only answers to the problems that the global economy faces today. I have just come from a meeting with Prime Minister Zapatero, who I count as one of my great friends and whose uh, work and achievements I and many, many people throughout the world admire greatly. I do not believe there is a country in the world that has moved faster and with more resolution to create women's rights, to create workers' rights, to create citizens' rights, to create gay rights, to create rights for the disabled, as Spain has done in these recent years. And I believe that you should be proud of the huge successes in extending the rights of individuals. And where these rights have been created, they can never, never be removed. Once a person has pride that they will not be submitted, subjected to prejudice and discrimination, they cannot ever be humiliated again. And I believe the legacy of Prime Minister Zapatero will be one that will be remembered not just in this continent, but in every continent. There is a story told about Olaf Palme, who was the Prime Minister of Sweden. And he went to talk to President Reagan in America in the 1980s about international development issues. And when he went in to see Reagan, Reagan wasn't quite sure who he was. And he said to his officials, isn't this man a communist? And his official said to him, no, President, this man is an anti-communist. And Reagan said, I don't care what kind of communist he is. <laughs> and Reagan asked Olive Palme, he asked him this question, isn't it true that you want to abolish the rich? And Palmy answered and said, no, I want to abolish the poor. I want to abolish poverty. I want to see every child in the world with a chance to realize the potential to the full. And that is also the ambition that was held by Prime Minister Zapatero. And I believe his achievements should be well remembered. It is a great pleasure to have been here today with your new leader who is fighting the election. And when I look at the manifesto for the election of the Spanish Socialist Party, your commitment to health reform, to tax reform, to a banking levy, your commitment also to enterprise, the creation of businesses, the funding of businesses, and in particular, your commitment to jobs. And this is the divide between left and right in the world at the moment. It's said by an American writer that there are two schools of philosophy at the moment. There are people who are called the wits. We are in this together. And there is a group who is called the yo-yo. You're on your own. I believe that that is the fundamental divide about whether we will support people at a time of crisis by ensuring that opportunities for young people and for jobs are there for people. And I believe on the side of this argument, the Spanish Socialist Party offers a way to the future. John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a great economist, was also a very good friend of mine. And he told me, and Alfred uh, will be interested in this, that on the 40th anniversary of the Austrian Republic in 1985, he, John Kenneth Galbraith, the world's great economist, was invited to speak in Vienna to the Austrian people. And in the front row of the audience was Professor von Hayek, the famous right-wing economist, and all the other members of the Austrian School of Right-Wing Free Market Economists. And John Kenneth Galbraith stood up and he said that he wanted to say, first of all, that the people of Austria owed a special debt to the free market economists, Professor Hayek, Heilbrunner, Mises, all the other right-wing economists. They owed them a special debt, he said, because if they had not left Austria in 1945 and stayed outside the country, then Austria would never have enjoyed the 40 years of prosperity <laughs> under social democratic policies that Austria had managed to achieve. And this is what your leader is saying for the elections, that jobs, business investment, enterprise, support of health reform, support of tax reform, a banking levy, 
are the way forward. And I applaud the manifesto and his leadership. And he is a great friend of mine whom I admire a great deal. Now, we meet here in a world where really three things are happening. First of all, people are aware of the huge opportunities that are available in the future. We have the rise of Asia. We have the growth of the middle class in Asia. We have the rise of the urbanized population. We have the rise of a more educated population. We have consumer demand that over the next 10 or 20 years out of Asia will change the world and mean that those businesses and those companies and those countries that can produce to meet this fast expanding market where there is more consumer demand than ever before, these companies and these countries and these individuals will benefit. But we also are aware of maximum risk. We're aware that a financial system that fell apart in 2008 is not stable and is not yet on a sustainable basis. And we're aware of a third thing, the popular anger and discontent about the way the financial system has been working and about the way people have lost jobs, people have lost their livelihoods, people have lost their savings, people have lost a huge amount as a result of the failure of the financial system. And I believe that people will look back and they will say that the last 20 years have been the most significant period of economic and social change in world history. Even bigger than the Industrial Revolution that started in Europe. Even bigger than many of the other changes that we've seen with technology and everything else. Because what has happened in the last 20 years is bigger than a financial crisis, is bigger than a crisis in one or two parts of the world, is bigger than just the rise of Asia. What we have seen in the last 20 years is two billion people have joined the world's industrial economy. That China, India, Asia, emerging markets have risen to such prominence that in 2010, for the first time in 150 years of world history, the first time in the history of industrialization, more goods were being produced in the rest of the world, more manufacturing was being produced in the rest of the world. More investment was taking place in the rest of the world than in the West, in Europe and America. So for the first time in 150 years, Europe and America has been outproduced, outmanufactured, outinvested, and of course, outtraded and outexported by the rest of the world. And this is a massive change that has taken place that means the world will never be the same again. This is, in fact, the biggest change of globalization. It is bigger than the financial crisis. It is bigger than what we have seen in our own countries. Because historians will look back and say, of all the changes, this new form of globalization, where you have the rise of so many different countries, the growth of numbers of people who are now part of the industrial population, and we who are progressives have got to respond to that. Because one other thing is absolutely critical to what happened in these last 20 years. The West, that is America and the European Union 27, may be outproduced and may be outinvested and may be outexported by the rest of the world as the emerging markets come to prominence. But they are not outconsumed. And there is this huge imbalance in the world economy that the majority producers are not the majority consumers. And the majority consumers are not the majority producers. And just look at the figures. The West, that is Europe and America, produces only 40% of the world's goods now. We produce only 41% of the world's investment. But we're still responsible for nearly 60%, probably about 55% now, of the world's consumption. So you have this imbalance between West and the rest. And it's got to be resolved at some point in the near future. We're at a critical juncture in world history where the vast majority of production is done outside Europe and America, but the vast majority of consumer spending still takes place in Europe and America. And it means there is a precarious balance in the world economy between East and West, between North and South. 10 years ago, America and Europe together could drive the world economy forward. 
because we were the majority producer and the majority consumer in the world. 10 years from now, perhaps 15 years from now, Asia with its massed, vast growth in production, but also in consumer spending that will take place in these years to come, may be able to drive the world economy forward on its own. But at the moment, no one continent can drive the world economy out of recession or drive the world economy to sustainable growth or drive the world economy in such a way that we use the resources we have of young people looking for jobs. You need a relationship. You need a balance. You need some deal. You need a pact between East and West if we're actually going to see jobs created, if we're going to see growth in our economies, if we're going to see sustained growth over the next few years. And that is why I come here today to say that this is not simply a European crisis. It's not a Spanish crisis. It's not a German crisis on its own. It's not a French crisis or a Greek crisis. This is a global crisis, and we have got to deal with it as progressives by finding a way that we can coordinate the economic policies of Asia and Europe and America and, of course, Latin America and Africa as part of that as well. So let's look at the epicenter of the problem, which is Europe today. Why is it that Europe, three years after the start of the financial crisis, which began in America, is now at the epicenter of this global economic crisis? And why is it that Greece, which is a small country, 2%, 3% of the European population, looks as if it's brought the rest of Europe to the brink? Why is it that Europe, which looked as if it was not responsible for the economic crisis in the first place, has now moved right to this historic position? And the answer, it seems to me, is that in Europe we have three problems and not just one. We think of Europe when we look at the newspapers and we look at the language of the right as experiencing a debt problem, a fiscal problem, a tax and spend problem, a profligacy problem. People look at Greece and they see the loss of tax revenues, the rise in public spending, and say something's got to be done to cut public spending so there is a fiscal problem. And of course in Greece there is a fiscal problem. And in some other countries, for a variety of reasons, there are problems of debts and deficits that have got to be dealt with. But that's not the whole story in Europe, as you perfectly well know. Europe has still a financial problem. It's got a banking problem. If you look at the uh, liabilities of German banks, because people don't at the moment think that Germany has a problem, the leverage of German banks, 32 to 1, in other words, their assets and liabilities are 32 times their capital. In America, it's 10 to 1. In other countries, it's between 10 and 20 to 1. In Germany, it's 32 to 1. In France, it's 26 to 1. And we have still got a financial crisis, a banking crisis in Europe that has not been resolved. And the reason is that when we decided in 2009 we would get rid of toxic assets and we would write them out of the balance sheets. In America, a lot of the toxic assets were written off. In Europe, very little. In 2009, we decided also we'd recapitalize our banks. And it's true to say that in America, they recapitalized their banks by about 4%. In Europe, it was only done by about 1%. In America and Britain, we said that we would have to lend. The banks would be forced to lend. And if they didn't lend, then they would be penalized for doing so. But we know the facts that lending by banks has not increased. It's actually decreased. And we said in 2009, when the financial crisis was there, we had to have global financial standards. You can't have a situation where the good banks and the good countries are undercut by the bad and the bad undercut by the worst because you've got a race to the bottom because you don't have proper global financial standards. And we decided in 2009 we would have these global financial standards, transparency, liquidity, capital ratios. Banks would have basic minimum standards that every country in the world would have to follow. And that has not happened either. So if you like these four deadly sins of banking, 
that the write-offs didn't take place, that the capital wasn't provided, that the lending wasn't done as promised, that the global financial standards were never introduced. These have come back to haunt us in Europe. And unless there is action taken to deal with the banking system and the financial system so that it can lend again to businesses in a way that means we'll create growth and jobs, then the financial crisis and the economic ramifications will be with us for years to come. So I've got no hesitation in saying that banking reform and financial sector reform is absolutely essential. And those people who say that this is just a crisis of austerity and debt and a crisis of profligacy on the part of people who have been spending too much money forget that this crisis started as a banking crisis. It continues as a financial crisis. It can only be resolved with fundamental reform of the financial system. And we, the progressives in the European Union and beyond, must champion the need for banking reform, not just in Europe alone, but also in America. Because what I see in the next few years, if nothing is done, is this. Banks are over leveraged and therefore at greater risk than they should be. Banks in Europe depend on lending from the wholesale markets, short-term lending from wholesale markets in a way that American banks and buy on deposits and equity do not do. And banks have a particular problem because if the interest rates uh, go up, then their funding difficulties become even greater. So unless we deal with this problem, we will see massive deleveraging by the banks over the next few years. That will take money out of our economies, and that will mean that businesses will not be able to grow and create jobs. So I would say when the European Council meets uh, next uh, Sunday, and when the G20 meets in November, they have got to focus their attention on financial sector reform so that once again we can talk about a sustainable economy that no longer has an unsustainable financial system underpinning it. Now, these are global reforms in banking, but here's the global growth pact that I think we could formulate. And I think it's up to us as progressives to put these ideas forward. We know that there's a precarious balance between East and West in the world. We know that the global consumers are not necessarily the global producers and vice versa. We know that the financial system is unsustainable without the recapitalization and the fundamental reform that I'm talking about. This is where the G20 comes in. This is why it was created. I'm proud that Spain is a represented at the G20 because it was never on the previous G20 before 2008. And it is right that Spain, a great economy in the world, should be part of the G20 process. But the G20 has got to prove by its results that it can make a difference. So I would propose a global growth pact. If China were to increase its consumer spending, if the rest of Asia were to open its markets to European and American and other exports, if in America we could see growth in infrastructure investment, and if in Europe we could see, in addition to the deficit reduction plans, expenditure on infrastructure to create jobs that would allow the, the economies of Europe to grow again. If we could have this global growth pact, then you would have a reinforcing, self-reinforcing cycle of growth. With Chinese consumption and consumer spending rising, there would be growth. With more exports and more trade around the world coming out of America and Europe, there would be more growth. With more infrastructure spending in Europe and America, there would be more growth. And as a result of the combination of the growth that was stimulated in each of these continents, we could see the world returning to growth. And this is not abstract theory. We asked the International Monetary Fund, not necessarily the most progressive of institutions in its history, to examine what would be the impact of a coordinated policy like this on growth and jobs around the world. And they had to report that growth would increase by 4% by 2014, 25 to 50 million extra jobs would be created, millions of them in Europe and America, and 100 million people would be taken out of poverty. So this is not a pie-in-the-sky proposal. This is not abstract theorizing. This is a practical proposal to get the world economy moving again, but to recognize that we are mutually dependent on each other for growth. And if we don't work together, 
then we will have not, if you like, mutually assured depression, but certainly mutually assured downturns in every continent of the world. And I believe we're at a point in world history where if we don't take these moves, and if we don't back that up by the reform of the financial system I'm talking about, then people will have little confidence in the future and we will be the first generation saying to our children that their prospects in the next generation will be worse than ours. And that is not a prospect that anyone, particularly anyone in progressive politics, should ever be prepared to contemplate. Now let me conclude by saying that what Prime Minister Zapatero did and what your socialist government in Spain did was for the first time you made Spain a major player in the international community as a donor in international development aid. And we should recognize if we're talking about a global growth pact, then part of the stimulus to the world economy will come from the power that can be derived from increasing the amount of spending that takes place and investment that takes place in Africa as well as in the rest of the world. And I believe that we should think more, even at this difficult time, about how by integrating the poorest continents and the poorest countries into our thinking about the global economy, we can also add to our ability as an economy globally to grow and prosper. You know, over these last 60 years since the Second World War, we have tried to build international institutions that recognize our responsibilities to each other. And we've tried to create conventions of human rights and charters that emphasize people's responsibilities and obligations to children, to those who are disabled, to people who are in difficulty, to women who have been discriminated against, to those who have been discriminated against on racial, racial grounds. And we've tried to create a responsibility to protect that means that the international community comes behind those people in greatest need, whether it be in Zimbabwe or whether it be in Libya or whether it be in Somalia or whether it be in Burma, in all those countries where human dignity has been stripped away by brutal and oppressive regimes. And I suppose the most terrible incident of the last 60 years is what happened in Rwanda in the 1990s. And if you go to the Children's Museum in Rwanda and you look at the memorial to people who died during that terrible set of weeks when a million Rwandan citizens killed each other, and if you look at the impact on children, you will see an exhibition. And one by one, a number of children who died in that genocide are listed and the photographs are there and the stories of their life are told. And I ask you to think of one child, a boy called David. And on this wall, there is only very basic information about this young boy. And it's about his life. And it says only this age 10, ambition to be a doctor, favorite sport, football, favorite hobby, making people laugh, death by mutilation, last words, the United Nations are coming to help us. And that boy's last words showed that in his innocence and in his idealism, he believed that the rest of the world would honor what they had said they would do. In his innocence and his an idealism, he believed that we, the rest of the world, through the United Nations, were coming to help prevent that genocide. In his innocence and idealism, in these words which were spoken to his mother, who was also brutally mutilated in that genocide, he thought, that there was indeed a global community which would assist each other. And we know that for all the promises we made and for all the pledges and for all the statements and for all the declarations and for all the conventions and for all the universal statements of what we would do, we failed there. I believe if we're going to make global institutions work, and there is such a thing as a global problem now, financial stability, global growth coordination, environmental and climate change disaster, then we've got to make a reality of our obligations to each other, 
I believe that we should have a charter of rights and responsibilities around the world. We should have a global government. It should be what describes our obligations to each other in the future as progressives, but also as human beings and as citizens. And I believe whether it is the financial crisis, which can only be met, a global problem with a global solution, or the climate change crisis, a global problem that everybody knows cannot be solved by one nation, but can only be solved by international cooperation, by global solutions, or whether it be the saving of human lives in a genocide, a global responsibility that we should have honored, as we said we would, would to help people in difficulty when they are assailed by people who are trying to deny them of their basic human rights. We should learn from what has happened in the financial crisis, but in every other crisis in the last 50 years. Global problems require global solutions. As progressives, we've got to recognize our interdependence with each other. We've got to build these global institutions that can deal with the problems that we face. Uh, and I believe that the only voices that can satisfactorily defeat the protectionism and the vested interests, which deny the fact that there are these global problems that, deny, that de need coordinated action, the only people who can say that are the progressive movements in this world. And therefore, for you to call this conference, for you to talk about ideas for the future, for you to represent as socialists and as social democrats uh, the need to think about the future is most commendable. But most of all, we don't need speeches that bring people to their feet. We need action that brings the world to its senses. And you are in a position to make that change. Thank you for the opportunity to speak.